Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we gather to celebrate your great victory over sin and death that was worked in your resurrection trial. Preserve us from thinking of your victory as a past event rather than a present reality. Help us to keep seeing signs of your resurrected presence in our world and in our lives. Cultivate in us, we pray, a vivid sense of your vitality among us that we may share the good news of Jesus' resurrection and the promise of forgiveness and grace sealed in your resurrection. In your holy name we pray. Amen. When I was younger, we used to go camping on our summer vacations, and we would go every once in a while for a week to this body of water which was called Gun Lake sounds much more intimidating than what it was, right? Gun Lake. We'd swim and boat and fish, all the things you normally do at a lake, but, but one of the things that always fascinated me, especially when I was younger, was dropping a pebble or a stone into the water, into the perfectly calm lake. You could only do this early in the morning, so I would get up, sometimes brothers and sister or my, my um, parents would go with me, we'd get up early in the morning and and we go down to the, to the lake, and, and if it's not day like today, with all this wind and all the crazy weather, it's calm. You go out into the water, and it's just crystal clear, for nothing has disturbed it. And, and you can almost, it's like glass, so smooth, you can see the reflection of the scenery in the water. Have you ever seen that before? It's amazing, right? And you pick up this stone, and it might be a big, it might be small, it could be anything, and you just toss it. Toss it up into the air, and as it falls, it lands into the water. And, and out, of this, out of this calm mirror bursts forth this difference. And it, and it plunges into the depths, and some water splashes up, and then ripples begin to form. And they make their way out into concentric circles, rippling across the water as if it would keep on going forever. I love to watch how far the ripples would go, how far they would reach. And the bigger the rock you threw, the longer the ripples would last, and the farther the ripples would travel on this otherwise calm lake. Have you ever done something like that? Yeah, most of us have. Now, the metaphor is not perfect, for our lives are far from calm most of the time. But, as I was reading Acts 1, this image of the stone or pebble that hits the water with ripples kept bombarding my mind. It kept driving itself into my head. And it kept with this perpetual idea that the resurrection of Jesus is a pebble dropped in the water of creation bursting forth with ripples that disturb, travel, and impact everything as these ripple effects from the resurrection go out into the world. Think about it. Right up until Jesus, we knew one thing for certain. One thing we knew for certain. The dead stay dead. And the future held this promise for all of us. We would all die and the dead stay dead. And then with one act of God, a new future and a new possibility bursts forth into the world. For the one certainty of life, the one sure thing we could all count on had a pebble dropped right through it. And disturbed and messed up all of the calmness of that certainty as Jesus is raised from the dead and boom! 
ripple upon ripple upon ripple cascades into our life. And because the dead don't stay dead anymore, who knows what might happen next? Who knows what might be certain in life? Now, the disciples didn't understand how disturbing this act of resurrection was for creation. But they knew that a pebble had been dropped in their water. And they felt the ripples in some way. It had burst into the calm of their life. And so they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They knew something had happened. And they imagined that God had a kingdom vision in mind for what he was doing with Jesus. A kingdom of Israel idea in mind. They thought that God had in mind what they always imagined would be their future. They always dreamed that the kingdom would be restored to Israel. That's as big as their dreams would go. And so that's what they thought God was up to in Jesus. You can almost hear the, 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 you can almost hear the vision in their mind forming. Restoring the kingdom of Israel. It's like a placard that could go on our front lawns, Right? Restore the kingdom of Israel. You could imagine like all the disciples going to a rally for their candidate. Restoring the kingdom of Israel, right? It's their vision. It's their, it's their call into what becomes the proclamation of what they're all about. I found this interesting George Bullard quote, though, this past week about vision. It gives you a little bit of an idea of what I was struggling with or wrestling with. He he writes this thing about vision. He says, vision is a movement of God that is memorable. Vision is a movement of God that is memorable rather than a statement of humankind that is memorized. Yeah. You can hear the memorized statement from the disciples. Restore the kingdom of Israel. Restore the kingdom of Israel. It's a memorized statement. They can regurgitate it at any time. They were taught it when they were young. They probably heard it from their parents. Restore the kingdom of Israel. God had a vision that was much grander and more memorable in mind, however. God's vision reached much further than they could ever imagine. God's vision was not about restoring the kingdom of Israel. God's vision was about the kingdom of heaven coming down into earth. God's vision was not simply about Israel. It was a vision that had ripple effects that would affect everyone. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The resurrection ripples out until it impacts the whole creation. Now we've been using this pebble in the calm water metaphor for the resurrection of Jesus, and I kind of like it my idea, so I like it, right? But if you know anything about this effect, it isn't endless, right? You toss the pebble into the water, and it makes a, a ripple effect. But, but what's happening there? It's interesting. I kind of looked it up. I wanted to make sure I understood the physics of it. The physics of it are pretty simple. The dropped pebble turns the potential energy in the water that's calm into kinetic energy by displacing it. The displacement of the, pe of the pebble turns the potential energy of the water into kinetic energy as it ripples out. But eventually, because of friction, the water will reach and return to equilibrium. Because of friction, the kinetic energy will 
pull back down into potential energy. It will burn itself out. And the water will go calm again. Now, if resurrection is like a pebble in the water, how does the ripple effect of new life in Jesus impact the whole creation? You. The answer is you. You are the ripple effect of new life in Jesus. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What that means, what I think that means at its heart is that Jesus is saying that each and every one of you has potential energy stored up in the very soul of your being. Each and every one of you created in the image of God has a spiritual potential energy within your life. That potential energy lies within you in equilibrium from the tips of your toes to the top of your head. You're filled with potential energy. And you were made to shine with the glory and love of God. You were created to reflect the power of God. You were remade in Jesus to show the new life of God. You are teeming with potential energy all over the place. Spiritual potential energy flows in your heart and mind just waiting to be unleashed. You're filled with it. but it's potential energy. It's potential energy, and it needs a reaction. It needs an agent, a stimulus that transforms that energy from potential to kinetic. From the core of who you are at equilibrium and rest into an, an agent of action and movement and energy. You need something in your life to transform you into the power that lies within you. Every one of you have this potential. You're filled with potential, but you need something to activate it, to stimulate it. You know what's wonderful about this text? Jesus promises that too. Not only does Jesus promise that you will be the ripple effect into the world, he promises the active stimulus and reagent that will bring the potential energy of your life into kinetic energy of action. Jesus says, you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit is the agent of God who brings the stimulus of resurrection into your life. The Holy Spirit is the one who releases that which is potential within you into kinetic energy that bounds with transformation in the world. The Holy Spirit is the one who enters into your life and drops the pebble of resurrection until it bursts out of you. You are Filled with that potential. The Holy Spirit is the one who unleashes the image of God from within you. Moving you from potential energy in your soul, in your mind, in your spirit into a live wire kinetic energy that transforms the world for goodness and love and grace. That is the Holy Spirit. And it's awesome to see and profoundly moving to experience within yourself. But it's interesting because just like the pebble in the water, your life will return to equilibrium without the reagent of God's Spirit actively stimulating you with the resurrected one. You know this to be true. 
without the Holy Spirit dropping the pebble of the living presence of Jesus into your heart and mind, your witness, your creation disturbing power begins to peter out, doesn't it? The ripple effects that you can create in the world begin to calm down and draw away when the Spirit is not a part of it. Have you noticed the ripples of resurrection waning in your life? Have you noticed when that happens? Is your witness to God's transforming grace gone silent at times? Have you had opportunities to share who Jesus is and then just been quiet? Have you not even noticed when the opportunities present themselves to share the good news of Jesus Christ? You know what's happening there, don't you? You're so full of potential energy, but you haven't let the Holy Spirit activate within you that which is necessary to make it kinetic, to make it real, to make it powerful in your life so that it bursts out of you. So what do we do? Well, the easy answer, of course, the Sunday school answer is, well, you need the Holy Spirit. Of course, you need the Holy Spirit. But you know that. You don't even need me to tell you that, right? Where do we re-engage with the Holy Spirit? Where do we re-engage with the one who activates our spiritual potential energy? When Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples who were with him, they all were sort of standing there, maybe mouth agape, right? I imagine they were all like, right? And then the two men, the two men come and address in white, and I think the first thing they do is they close their mouth, right? And the, the two men come up and go, right? And they say, why are your heads up in the clouds? Right? And the disciples for the first time go, oh, look at who's here with us. Maybe we notice when we stop looking up. And, and the, the two men that asked them this, that I think kind of closed their jaw, I think they're sort of saying, like, if, if you're up here, you're not going to see Jesus. You're, you're sure as heck not going to get re-engaged with the Holy Spirit because that's not where the Spirit is at work. That's not where Jesus is, you know, because I don't see anything or anybody up there. Well, as soon as I looked down, I said, oh, look at all of you. Look at all of this. And so then it becomes interesting because the disciples, after they're kind of told, Jesus isn't up there, he's here, then they begin to do something that's going to engage them with the Holy Spirit. And the text says to us that they return to Jerusalem, gather together as a community, and pray. So how do we meet the Holy Spirit? How do we meet the spirit that turns that potential energy of our life into kinetic energy? Well, it's simple. There's three steps. The disciples are told that they're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, and then Judea and Samaria, and then all the earth, right? They're told where they're going to be witnesses, and then where do they go? They go to Jerusalem. That which where you're supposed to witness, that's where your attention needs to be. That where you're supposed to go to talk about who Jesus is and, oh yeah, meet him, that's where your attention needs to be. So the disciples do that. They return to Jerusalem, and lo and behold, in a few weeks, we're going to hear about how the Holy Spirit meets them in Jerusalem, right where they're supposed to be witnessing. So what does that mean for us? We meet the Holy Spirit where God has called us to witness. So our attention and focus needs to be on our communities, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. If the only thing you think about with the gospel or with Jesus is here, you're not going to meet the Spirit very much. Because the Spirit has called us out there to witness. That's where the Spirit will meet us. Exactly where the Spirit told us we're to witness. Our focus needs to be out there. Let me give you a quick example. 
A quick example of what I think is true. So Lisa Bontemps, you know, you know her well, she's a piano player. She joined the Rotary. She in the Rotary, and she decided that she was going to tell the Rotary about this great program that's led by Lou and George called Circle of Friends. So we feed the community, we open it up, and, it's, and, and the Rotary said, we kind of want to help with that. So her focus and attention is out on the community. She simply tells them what's going on, and they say, oh, we want to do that. We want to help. So, okay, well, that's fine. She goes and talks to Lou and George and says, yeah, January would be fine. The Rotary can do it. So what does she do? She says, well, a few Rotary members, come on in the church. We'll make the meal together in the church kitchen, and then a few will serve it and everything else. And they come in. So just doing the work, just doing stuff out in the community, doing things for the community, doing the work. They're cooking, they're cutting vegetables, they're doing their thing. And lo and behold, what does one of the members of the Rotary say? This is really interesting. Why do you do this? Ding, 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 ding. Pay attention. It's time to witness. Your focus is out where it's supposed to be, and the Holy Spirit enters in. And she tells me that she just started talking about what it means to be a Christian. I'm like, that's really fascinating. I've never thought about it like that. And they started asking more questions about who Jesus was. They started asking more questions about what are the kinds of things that you do in this church. They started asking more questions. It's almost as if God had set it all up. Imagine that. All she had to do is turn her focus to the exact place he told her to witness. Imagine that. And then be ready. And all of a sudden, all this potential energy that was in her was transformed into kinetic energy. That's kind of how it works. It's kind of how it works. And you have this potential kind of witness going on, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit shows up, and it's sort of like, oh, wow, this is pretty interesting. Maybe this is exactly the way that God had in mind. The second thing, right? This is the second thing. First thing is, go where God has called us to witness. The Holy Spirit will show up. Second thing, the disciples gathered together there. There are no lone rangers. We don't go off on our own. Our worshiping community shapes us for witness and forms us for meeting the Holy Spirit. We need to have a community because then we begin to understand where the Spirit is showing up in each other. Very quickly, we're doing um, this uh, discipleship group thing called The Journey. And let me tell you, we gather together in this journey around this table, and, and we start talking about the things that we're reading, and we start talking about our own lives. We start sharing things that we might not share with anybody else. We begin to open ourselves up in real and true community, talking about our struggles and our triumphs, talking about the things that we've not told anybody talking about the things that are really sort of make us real and truly a community. And let me tell you right now, because I can see the head shaking of all the people that are part of the journey right now, the Holy Spirit has shown up. Let me tell you. Because all of a sudden, things are really real. And you begin to know stuff about each other.